Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here's your host, Joe Kuzma and Zach Celedonia. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Joe Kuzma, and joining me today, uh, back after a little bit of a hiatus here to talk wide receivers in the NFL draft, a one Flash Zach Celedonia. Flash, how you doing, my friend? Uh, you say wide receivers, man. I come running. I'm ready. Let's let's ride. Yeah, let's ride. Well, the Steelers signed someone named Flash also since we last talked. So yeah, yeah. yeah. How about that? Some stolen valor going on on the show right now. <laughs> I, I I'm open to the idea of there being two flashes in Pittsburgh. I just hope this town is big enough for the both of us because Cordero Patterson apparently refers to himself and his nickname is, is Flash as well. So. We'll see how that goes. I, I, I'm willing to accept a second flash in, in the city as long as he knows who comes first. Oh, well, okay. I'm assuming he took 84, though. And there's some people yeah. that were complaining about that. And it's like they've given out 84. Rico Bussy had 84. There was also some like random tight end or something that may have been on the practice squad for a hot minute and i want to say there was like one other like a matthew sexton or somebody another receiver i've given that number out a few yeah. times and people antonio all, brown himself tweeted that rico yeah. bussy antonio brown's been back and forth he's all butthurt about it but he also was like rico bussy wore it so like not a big deal i'm less concerned about patterson picking 84 and Merck more concerned with the fact that he's trying to steal my namesake with flash so the 84 is not a big deal i'm more zeroed in on the flash nickname thing right now but if, if he takes I'll say three. I'll say three kickoffs back for touchdowns. Then he can be flash. But oh, that's, that, that's the bar he has to meet. Does he have to do that all this this season, or can he do yes. that like he, like if he plays till he's thirty eight? Okay, we'll see. No, this season right now for the two thousand twenty four Steelers, we need at least three kick return touchdowns. Hey, speaking of, what do you think about that? Like, kind of, uh, almost like the XFL rule that they're adopting. Like, I like it. I know some people are just like, Ooh, I'm like, but they toyed around with the kickoff so much these sky and mortar kicks and everything else. And then no wedge, um, no unbalanced like lines, like each side has to be balanced. And it, it just made everything and then fair catches made everything impossible. I think like the only one I wasn't cool with was the, it was one of the, I think it comes out like the 35 on one of the conditions. And I was like, eh, 25 would be okay. Let's bring it back to the 20. But NFL is just like gung-ho on let's score, score, score. Because the other one, if it goes out of bounds, that's just the regular rule. It was the 25 and then the 15-yard penalty and you started at the 40. So um, I hadn't talked to you. I was just curious what you thought about that. Since a lot of receivers happen to do the return game too. I think it fits into your wheelhouse. Well, exactly. And I think you talked yourself through it there. I think the NFL has been on a quest to solve kickoff returns for the longest time because circa the James Harrison era, when people were getting knocked out and everybody was trying to uh, do fines for, for illegal hits, and, and they realized that special teams were a big source of where a lot of injuries came from. I think they've been trying to make it safer but they got to a point where they realized they kind of ruined the fun behind it because they, you almost never see a kickoff return for a touchdown anymore. Pump returns are a little more likely. They didn't mess with that too much, but kickoff returns, you almost never seen one brought back for a touchdown these days. So I, I like what they're trying to do because there will still be fair catches every so often. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I, I like what I saw somebody, uh, they phrased it this way saying that, the way the NFL has changed the kickoff return rule now is there's still going to be touchbacks and there's still going to be a lot of dead time between changing possessions uh, through kicking off. But there's about a 30% chance, give or take, more or less, that teams are going to be more prone to take it out now. So mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're trying to bring back kickoffs in a sense. Um, it, it's their first attempt at kind of changing sides from – we have to be super, super safe to let's get a little bit more of the excitement in this part of the game brought back. So there's going to be some kinks to work out, but I, I like that they're at least putting effort forth to try and like make it more fun for the fans because, yeah, the whole dynamic of taking a kickoff back for a touchdown has kind of been eliminated. And uh, when that rule passed, funny enough, 
in the same day, I think, maybe it, maybe uh, less than 24 hours later kind of thing. But when that rule passed, they were going to be changing the kickoff return rules and how it was formatted before Daryl Patterson was signed. And his agent even came forward and admitted, like, yeah, we were waiting for something like this to happen to get my client, Patterson, more money. And um, not that the Steelers signed him for anything crazy, but he probably ended up getting about another extra couple million just because this rule changed because Patterson's value increased because that that's a mm-hmm. big part of his game. He's not going to be used as a receiver hardly at all. He doesn't play receiver anymore despite his his jersey number designation. He He's more of a utility running back and, and a return specialist exclusively. He, he's a lot like a Debo Samuel, but lesser and older where he's not going to play any receiver. He's just going to run the ball a lot where Debo at least plays receivers on He's mainly the Steelers' return specialist, and for what they paid him for, for getting arguably the best kick returner in the league, I, I like the signing, obviously, and, and I uh, I like the rule change, too, just, just for what it is right now. I, it, very, very raw state of what we're looking at here with the kickoff, ret- kickoff return rule change, but I like it. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I always like the extra point rules in the XFL, but that works better in the XFL because of the, well, UFL or whatever you want to call it now, uh, because of the disparity in talent. But I digress. We're here to talk NFL draft. A little over a week away. Exciting times. Everyone's just um, everyone's just trying to bullshit everybody right now. And it's just, it's really fun. And I mean, we're looking at, I've been trying not to talk wide receiver too much without you because this is, uh, this is your favorite topic every time of the year. And it looks like the Steelers are in the market for a wide receiver. Now, the first first question is, of course, the title question of the show is, which round will the Steelers target a wide receiver? And obviously, we cannot do that without talking about the various prospects and the team needs. So I guess the very first question we would throw out there, because I've seen some mock drafts, and I guess we could pretty much just say the top three receivers in this draft who should be, in no particular order, Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze. They should all be like top 10 picks and out of the Steelers' reach. So we probably will not discuss them whatsoever. Be entirely shocked and probably happy if Omar Khan made some type of play at those guys, right? So then where do you go from there? And I know some folks were, we, we were mocking the mock drafts last, in last week's show, myself and Brian. And one of the things, if you didn't catch all of that, Zach, was... Brian Thomas landed the Steelers at one point at pick 20. Now, I don't find that likely for a number of reasons. Number one, I'm not sure that they would use pick 20 on him. They might actually run to the podium. That could be the other way of looking at it. Dude's fast, dude's big. It just seems unlikely with the way they've been kind of uh, looking at offensive linemen, I think particularly sp- like right tackle specific players and some centers. It really looks like, though, that the first round prospects are on the offensive line. Would they use pick 20 on some, if it wasn't Brian Thomas, who a lot of people think, Hey, he could go to the Bengals. You know, they lost Tyler Boyd. They, uh, T Higgins is asking for a trade. He's been franchise tagged. He hasn't signed any kind of extension. He hasn't signed his tag. So there might be a need there or he may go to some other team. Um, I don't know. What was it going to say? Like the saints or somebody like that. I don't know. Uh, yeah. but we've seen him go all over the, all over the place. But then what do you do with the guys right after that? And that's where I'm like, is 22 rich for the Steelers' blood? Um, if they if they pass on somebody at pick 20, and some of the guys that we could talk about that they've had in for visits that probably will be available at 20, but will they be available at 51? Are they a second round pick? Are the Steelers looking third round and then beyond? What do you uh, fill in some blanks for me, brother? Because like it, it seems like they could go anywhere with this. I just feel like when you're kind of um you're kind of lining up like you're looking at a draft board and you see okay wide receiver five is what's available now no matter who you have as your wide receiver five four gone off the board and the Steelers are picked 20 and you've got right tackle two and maybe center one on your board one of the interior offensive linemen one of the top guys on your board how do you pass on them over a wide receiver I don't know that that that's the hardest part of this all man is the Steelers have painted themselves into this corner, it seems, where everybody knows they need a wide receiver opposite of George Pickens. They need a tackle opposite of Broderick Jones. They need a corner opposite of Joey Porter. And they need a center. So they have four glaring needs. And you could argue five if you want to throw in. Their defensive line isn't by any means set. They have three good starters 
great if you count Cam Hayward and Keanu Benton. Looks like he has the good stuff, but they, they could use defensive line help as well. And the way they have put themselves in the situation, it, it makes it very hard for people to zero in on what exactly they're thinking in the first round. What I can tell you is, as far as receiver is considered in the first round, they've only shown interest in really three guys to different levels that are supposed to be first round picks. One is Brian Thomas Jr. They met with him at the combine. The LSU receiver, the guy who played with Malik Neighbors, who's supposed to go top five. Brian Thomas Jr. gets a lot of Martavis Bryant comparisons. The simplest way I can put it. Better hands to an extent, but very tall, very fast, freakish type of wide receiver, touchdown machine. He is supposed to go in the first round. However, the Steelers only met with him at the combine. They didn't bring him in for a top 30 visit. I'll get to those guys in a second. They only met with him at the Combine, and since then, the interest has seemed to have kind of just plateaued. We haven't heard anything else about Brian Thomas Jr. outside of that Combine meeting. Same with Roma Dunze. They met with Roma Dunze at the Combine, who is supposed to be gone almost certainly top 10. So I know they like him. There are some people who think Adunze might be the best receiver in the whole draft, which I tend to not necessarily push back that hard on. I feel like one, two, and three neighbors, Harrison and Adunze, all three of them, it's like wide receiver one, wide receiver one B, wide receiver one C. They're they're mm-hmm. all worthy of that top pick and have great all around games. Can immediately come in and be their their team's best receiver at, at the least. Their wide receiver two to eventually become their best receiver. Kind of like when the Falcons drafted Julio Jones really high and still had Roddy White. So I don't necessarily believe that first round receiver is that possible. The, th- the third guy was Adonai Mitchell from, from Texas, who I like. I think he's a great player, but he has a lot of George Pickens tendencies in his game. And I don't mean that in the most endearing way. I mean, he's very unique. He, he'll take plays off. He, he's very emotional. If he's not getting the ball, he kind of gets out of the game. But when he's involved, he he's a game wrecker. So he'll go first round. I'm almost positive. But do the Steelers want to add another guy like George like that? To their roster, not forget skill wise because George Pickens skill wise, yeah, you'd want two George Pickenses, but two guys that could be yeah. just mentally out of the game by the third quarter if they're not getting their targets. Not to mention, there's no real leader in that room right now. It's kind of a roll of the dice to go with a guy like Mitchell. Although I do like his game, I think the chances of a first round wide receiver are very small based off of what the Steelers are showing us because they've met with a whole lot of more guys who were supposed to go rounds two, three, or later. Um, Their top 30 visits, as of today, they had two left. And I'm a little foggy on the timeline of events because they had two guys in today for a visit, uh, two offensive linemen. So I don't know if that calculation was done before or after this. But of their top 30 visits, guys that are allowed to bring in to Pittsburgh to see the facilities and Usually it's a good indicator of who the Steelers are seriously considering because they don't want to waste a top 30 visit on like a smoke screen. It's a big deal. You only get 30 of these. Uh, they've brought in Ricky Pearsall from Florida, who's viewed as a second, third round pick. Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky, second, third round pick. Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, firmly a second round pick, I would say. Luke McCaffrey, who's a day three pick, brother of Christian McCaffrey. He's he's for sure day three, but they brought him in for a visit, showing they're looking at him. Uh, Mitchell from the first round. He's the only first round prospect to be brought in for a 30 visit, wide receiver anyway. And Lad McConkey from Georgia, who's like probably a second round pick, maybe, maybe, maybe late, late first if the Chiefs want to take a swing on him. But that tells me they are pretty certain they're not going to be able to get a guy in the first round, but they're doing a lot of homework on rounds two through like five because they see that they're not going to be in a position to draft the top three guys. And when they're picking at number 20, do you want to take a guy like Brian Thomas who who may be worth it? Or do you want to take possibly the, the, the third best tackle or the second or third best corner? Because they have needs at all four of the spots that I mentioned, tackle, corner, receiver, center. You don't want to draft strictly for need, but it needs to be incorporated in. You have to mix and match. You can't draft for need. That's how you end up reaching. But if you can find a way to mix together need and best player available, that's usually how the Steelers operate. And given that formula and given what they need, a 
I think it's most likely they select a tackle or a corner in the first round and, and try to get their receiver in the mid round. I will say this though, when you go through mark simulators and you try to like do this yourself, um, it's really hard <laughs> to get a good receiver yeah. in the third round. Yeah. Like these guys, it's top heavy and it's a historical class, top heavy wise. But once you get past the top like seven or eight guys, it, it it's not as good as the national draft circuit has made it out to be. I, I've been in a situation many times doing mock simulators where I get to the third round. Let's say I go tackle first round, center second round. By the time I get to receiver in the third, there's almost nobody left. These guys like Pearsall, Corley, Leggett, uh, McConkey, they're all gone. So I don't think it's as simple as predicting who the Steelers are going to take at 20 and then 51 and then 84, their first three picks. I, I think it, there's a little bit more to that where you're going to see some kind of movement because I don't know how they accomplish checking off all these boxes with the picks they have. Because I think most people agree they want them to address tackle and center, for sure. Th those are most serious needs. But you can't ignore the, the just gaping hole at wide receiver opposite of George Pickens. They have to figure out a way to get that box checked off, too. And um, th that that's the situation that we're in right now is that they – they they've shown interest in some first round guys, but not a lot. So I think their their ideal draft scenario right now is to get offensive line taken care of, and then receiver. Um, there's a risk associated with that because you might end up not with the receiver you want, but it's just kind of the situation they're stuck with right now. Yeah, and some of these guys really come off uh, in some cases as like slot receivers or sp slot specific too. I struggle. Yep. I struggle to figure out. So, and then there's there's names that haven't been mentioned, and um, I wasn't sure that they met with McConkie. It depends where the hell you look. I try and follow most of what Dale Lawley's put on the, uh, out there and compile it into a spreadsheet. And between that and some of the others, I have as many as thirty four visits now. Um, several of those, local. yeah. So the local ones don't count. So there's several guys. I, that's what I was looking at right here. So let's see: one, two, Zach Frazier, center, uh, West Virginia. Beanie Bishop just visited, both from West Virginia. It might not be the only two West Virginia. I think uh, they had a pick guy or two. Yeah, MJ Devonshire, and then um, who's the other? Matt uh, Gon uh, Calvis. Uh, tackle. Yeah, tackle. So there's at least four. And Penn State might count, too, with Daquan Hardy, who's another defensive back, uh, more or less like a day three or undrafted free agent type guy. Uh, that's where a lot of those are. They do get lucky with that local visit thing uh, in the case of Zach Frazier because we're thinking he's definitely going to be a top 100 pick, if not a top 50 at the center spot. So... I don't know how much more they got left. Malachi Corley, Western Kentucky. And talk about that guy. I've seen him. I haven't seen him in first round mocks, but man, he comes close and he has visited probably at least a dozen schools. They're including like the Cleveland Browns within their own division. There are a lot, a lot, of, lot of interest in Malachi Corley for sure. I've noticed he's getting a lot of top 30 visits and he's a coveted player. So of the guys who I'm projecting as a mid round pick, he's one of he's probably the front runner as the guy that I think might go higher than people are expecting. McConkey kind of to a certain degree as well because some people love McConkey's game from Georgia, but I think Corley and McConkey are two guys that if the Steelers want either of them, they'll probably have to pounce earlier than expected. But that's not their style is the thing. I, I like both of their game. Uh, Corley is, is an all around receiver, great out of the slot. He can run the ball too. Very physical guy. There's a reason why he's getting so many visits because he's yeah. coveted. Yeah. And and McConkey, the tape speaks for itself with McConkey. He he does everything the right way. He's a very refined route runner, good speed, great hands. He kind of suffers from like the short white guy view where it's like, oh, is this guy really that good or is he a product of his college system? I think he is that good. That's why you have some people talking about maybe the Chiefs will take him with the last pick. I, but as far as being able to get one of those two guys, they may have to take them earlier than expected just because they, the, the two of them and Corley, who, who you mentioned first there, they have so much hype around them. I, I, I see the most common mock draft I see, and I think everybody has seen this at this point. What do you see? You see Mims in the first round, mm -hmm. tackle out of Georgia, Frazier in the second round, the center, and then Corley in the third round. That, that, I'd go to bed happy with that. That's a pretty perfect scenario in the first three rounds, but it almost never happens that way 
to to a T. There's going to be some team that's higher than on higher on a guy than you're expecting, and that's when they go higher, and that's when a run on a position occurs, and that's what I'm worried about with wide receiver. I'm worried that they'll take tackle center, and then by the time they get to the third round, they're looking at guys who were just strictly supposed to be day three guys, not a third round guy. I'm talking fourth, fifth, sixth round guys. Yeah. And that's when you get into the situation where you reach for a guy and he doesn't work out. So there's as close as we are to the draft, we're 10 days away right now as we're recording. There's still a lot of uncertainty and a lot of gray area with, with what they're thinking, ha- with how they're going to prioritize the, these three main needs um, for if it counting corner. So I, I don't know. I, 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 I <laughs> well, oh, I'll put some words in your mouth here. They traded for Dante Jackson. So corner is kind of like, it might be a luxury, but I was almost mocking corner in the first round myself. I'm looking at like Nate Wiggins sitting there from Clemson. And I'm like, man, if he's there at 20 and you could pair him up with Porter, like, Ooh, exactly. They, they yeah. had Wiggins in for a visit. So corner could, I think corner and tackle are the two spots where they've had the most first round guys come in for 30 visits. So I think they're most likely to go one of those two routes. I've long said, I don't think they have to take their center in the first round. You just almost never have to do that. Centers aren't drafted in the first round very often at all in the first round. You have to be viewed as a future hall of famer, a future 10 time pro bowler to get picked in the first round as a center, like the Pouncey brothers, Jackson powers, Johnson and and Zach Frazier. They are supposed to be very good instant starters, but they don't have the kind of hype that the Pouncey brothers had coming out or a guy like Tyler Lindenbaum who went first round or um, Travis Frederick. That was unexpected when the Cowboys did that, but they were right about that. Center isn't a very commonly first round pick position. So I've almost eliminated that entirely as, as their first round choice outside of the idea that they may trade back and then, okay, I, I would be okay with it then. But taking a center at 20 in the first round is just bad business in the NFL. I know they need it really badly, but they can get a top-tier center in the second round, maybe even the third. So I think center and tackle are the most likely first-round spots. And um, the only issue with passing on tackle at that point is the drop-off with tackle talent in the draft when you get from first to second round it is unlike any other. Yeah. Maybe quarterback is the only other spot that is close to it, but... There's a reason why tackles in the first round get picked in the first round and, and are viewed as like such a valuable position because they're supposed to be staples of your franchise for years and years to come. And I don't um, know if the Steelers are going to be able to get a tackle that's going to make any type of impact or difference on this team without taking him in the first round. Um, which which that then leads you, though, to the Dan Moore conversation because with all these needs they have in the the slim chance that they're able to check off all of these needs. There is a reality out there that Dan Moore starts one more year. And I know people don't like that. A lot of people get mad at me and, and they, they, they misinterpret what I'm trying to say when I bring up Dan Moore starting this year. It's, I don't think he's very good. I'm not a Dan Moore fan, but he's the one spot of these positions that the Steelers have an incumbent starter at and are comfortable with and have shown they have confidence in. They're just fine trotting him out there and saying, go to work. They, they think he's good enough to be starter capable. You can't say the same for the receiver opposite of George Pickens. You can't say the same for center. You could argue Dante Jackson might be that guy to just start, but tackle is really the only glaring need they have where they have an incumbent starter that they may be like, listen, guys, our hands are tied here. We can't, we, we can't take a tackle in the first round and miss out on corner. And say, like, so that that's the one spot that, I think a lot of national people and a lot of people who hate Dan Moore are, are missing th- th- this point of emphasis. It's like, dude, they, they're comfortable playing him and, and they might end up playing him this year. I'm not necessarily a fan of it, but when I sit down and try to go through all of these situations and how the first three to four rounds may unfold, I just keep coming back to, they could just pass on tackle this year and get it next year and start Dan Moore. And that way they get their corner, their receiver, their center, no problem. If they pass on tackle in the first round, take a guy in the second, who, who knows if he's even going to be better than Dan Moore? Take a guy in the first, then yeah, he's probably supposed to be the starter at some point here. But even Mims, the guy from Georgia, most people believe if they take Mims at 20, he probably won't start till like week six or seven. He's very raw, more raw than Broderick Jones was. 
Yeah. So, so that's my problem with Mims and everybody's putting Mims there and he met with the team and he had um, 297 offensive snaps last year with Georgia. You go look at JC Latham. Did they bring Latham? I think they brought Latham in too. Let me look here. Uh, if he's on the list, I'm wanting to say they just did, but maybe I'm not. But you look at somebody like Latham uh, who might be ranked ahead of him, depending on where you're looking, right? And uh, Latham had 874 snaps just last year. That's almost as many as Mims had in his entire collegiate career. It just is very un Steeler like on Mike Tomlin, like he'd be banging his fist and like, mm, I know he's from a bit, I know he's a big dude, six seven three forty is what he's listed at, but did it go there? And that's like where it like leaves the door open, you know, we're with wide receiver, but we can make that argument. Okay, you could get a center in a second round, you might have to get a tackle, but what if they don't get tackle? Well, then they could go corners, corner that big a needs since they traded for Jackson. Okay, let's say they come back around and they do something for the offense. Uh, and yeah. it's not a center and it's not a tackle. And also the other point is, are they going to play two rookies on the offensive line, a new right tackle and a new center plus moving project Jones over for his first pro season as a left tackle in year two, after only playing about half the season last year, that's a lot of moving parts, as I said, and maybe not something that they're going to jump at doing. Likewise though, if they draft a wide receiver, now we saw pick and slide right in and play right away. But that isn't usually Mike Tomlin's style either with either of those positions, corner or wide receiver. But is there a guy that is here that kind of fits into this list? You look at A.D. Mitchell from the from Texas, and you're like, well, I don't know if they're going to go with him for 20, a, a pick 20 over a center, a, a right tackle, potentially. They One left tackle they did look at. You've got basically the same names with these guys. I was joking about this before. You got Fuaga, you've got uh, Fontenot from Washington, and, and he's a left tackle. Then you've got Mims. Today, yeah. And then you've got Tyler Guyton, Blake Fisher, and those guys should start to slide a little further down the list. Might be a pick 51 range, maybe even into the third round for the Fisher out of Notre Dame. And they've got two third round picks, but you bounce back around. Okay, Xavier Leggett, for example, from South Carolina. I just saw him uh, mock to like Kansas City or something like that. Yeah. Like rate or or the maybe even the 49ers at the end of the late, first late, round. Late late first, early second. That's it, that's the consensus on, on uh Leggett. Yeah. So probably not gonna be there at 51, but they they've done their homework. What if what you say about Mitchell is true? And he has a slide. Like Pickens had all these physical gifts, but he had some injury history, and everybody was like, mm, I'm gonna pass on this guy and just let him like slide right down to the Steelers, right? Uh yeah. who else is on this list? Ricky Pearsall out of Florida possible is he a second rounder or is he a third rounder Corley we don't know he could be anywhere like you had just mentioned uh another name that didn't um uh, pop up here in the visits Taj Washington USC probably I got him down here I think I had, I went back I went through him too mm -hmm. fast I didn't give him a round projection because no, okay. I don't really have him like figured out as as far as round projection but yeah he's top 30 visit right between Leggett and McCaffrey I I like his game he's not I, but he doesn't like jump off the, the screen to me by any means that's why like they're casting a wide net here trying to figure out what they can do wide receiver because they know they're they're stuck they they can't go out there with george pickens and van jefferson and, and quez Watkins and say okay go to no. work russell wilson go to work fields <laughs> whoever's playing they can't do that and i think that is why it opens the door for a trade for brandon Ayuk. and this is different than the draft receiver topic that i'm supposed to be talking about but it's not because, because the then you can go, then you don't have to grab a wide receiver. We can go back to the other positions you were talking about. Exactly. And I can yeah. see why people would be like, well, you're still giving up a pick to take a wide receiver. So what's the difference? The difference is I think the Steelers can pull off a trade for Brandon Ayuk, who's a proven great wide receiver, 26 years old, worth the money he's about to make. They can swap first round picks with the 49ers. Niners go up to 20. We get 31. We still have a first round pick. And a lot of these guys we're talking about that are supposed to be like late first round picks, even Mims to a degree, if he's too raw, Zach Frazier, the center, a receiver like uh, Mitchell or Leggett, or I, I guess a receiver wouldn't be, that, that was dumb. Receiver won't be needed, but I guess, if they well, can double dip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they can keep their first round pick and swap with the Niners, that would check off a box of a need that they have wide receiver and still give them the ability to take a different position in the first round. And, Personally, I don't think Ayuk is going to cost like a king's ransom. I think the Niners, their hands are kind of tied. I think everybody can see that they're in a situation over there where they can't afford to keep this guy. 
even though they're doing all the lip service and all the interviews, John Lynch talking to reporters, but when you see John Lynch mention Brandon Ayuk in an interview, he goes to social media and says it's bullshit. Like he, he's speaking out on his own behalf and he's making a stink about this and he wants paid. More often than not, these guys get paid. And don't mistake it for like any kind of character issue. Brandon Ayuk has never caused any kind of issues. He's just doing what most good wide receivers do and he's trying to leverage himself in a position to get a good contract. I don't think the Niners can pay him. The Steelers have been linked to Brandon Ayuk this whole time since he's been brought up as a trade candidate. They make sense for a destination because they have nobody outside of George Pickens that you can have any type of belief in. And it makes sense from a roster standpoint because they need a receiver. It makes sense from a compensation standpoint because I think offering the Niners 20 to bump back to 31 could be quite enticing for them. And I think if you go off of like the NFL's trade value chart um, created by Jimmy Johnson originally, they could probably pull this off by swapping first, trading them our fourth round pick this year potentially, and our second next year to get Ayuk. That would still give you your second and third round pick this year, giving you the chance to check off a center in the second round or a tackle in the second round if a guy falls. There's a chance that happens. Or in the third round, take best player available. I'm that's why I have the door wide open for the Ayuk thing because the Steelers are just stuck right now when it comes to the receiver room and with the makeup of their team, most importantly, how little the quarterbacks are getting paid, they can make a move like this and maximize their team. This is what you can do when you aren't paying a lot of money into your quarterback room. You can make big moves like this and acquire a really good player, still young, get him extended, get him paid. Put him onto your team and go. So I'm really open to that idea, mainly because, not mainly because, but a reason being that when I try to go through all these draft scenarios with receivers, if they don't take a guy in the first and they take a center in the second round, there is a really good chance by the third round they just don't have many options available to them. Yeah, they could get Luke McCaffrey in the fifth or sixth round, but is that your starter opposite George Pickens? Probably not. So it, it it just comes down to making the deal with the 49ers and not giving up too much. And that's a part of this, too. I, I have found that so many people, they, they begin and end the conversation with, well, I don't want to give up too much. I don't want to give up the farm for this guy. Buddy, I don't want that either. Nobody wants that. That's something that I feel like comes up in every one of these trade conversations. It's like, well, I don't want to give up too much. I can tell you right now, there's like nobody is going to want to come out and say, I want to give up this year's first, next year's first, another first, couple seconds. Nobody wants to do that. I want to acquire Brandon Ayuk for the right price. And that is something that I think some people struggle to understand. They just they, they want to shut you off right away and make you feel small and dumb. And, oh, well, you don't understand. He's going to cost a lot of money. Brother, he's going to cost a lot of money because he's a top 10 wide receiver in the NFL and he's really, really good and we need a wide receiver. Some people are so resistant to just paying a player. You, you, can't, you can't create a championship roster. You can't be a good team without paying some guys. We're all just used to just paying defense, though, this town. So it's like it's a little different. Like, oh, I don't want to pay a wide receiver. <laughs> I know he's not Antonio Brown yet. But He's the only guy is, who's ever got a bag in Pittsburgh was the Antonio Brown. So everybody yeah. else just goes. That's why there's this stigma to it. Exactly. There, there's so much stigma around it. And that, that's what makes these conversations so hard to have with people because it's always so this or that. It's so black and white. It's like, oh, you want Brandon Ayuk? That must mean you don't have an understanding of the future of the team or how the cap uh, space works. No, I understand all of that. I just think... This is the perfect time with the lack of money in the quarterback room, the need at wide receiver, the the pick at 20 that could be enticing to the 49ers at 31 to swap. It's all right there for them. Brandon Ayuk never tweets, never goes on Twitter. He's one of those players. Tweeted Mike Tomlin for the first time in a year talking about how they look yeah. alike and making a joke out of that. And you got guys like Ben Albright, who is a very – well-connected insider in NFL circles. He's right there with Ian Rappaport and Adam Schefter, only he's not paid by the NFL to be one of the mainstream guys. He's Denver-based. He's a Denver Broncos guy, 
but he has nearly 200,000 followers on Twitter for a reason. He's more right than he is wrong. And the thing about Ben is, and I appreciate this about him, he loves dunking on people. He loves being right. He loves bragging about it. And out of the blue yesterday, he tweeted a text message that he had saved from somebody on March 15th talking about how the Steelers were trying to get Ayuk for Russell Wilson, to be a weapon for Russell Wilson. Out of the blue, he, he tweeted that. And it wasn't because Brandon Ayuk requested a trade. He hasn't gone that far yet. But he, to what I understand, is hearing that it's not going good in San Francisco. He's not going to be there. It's very, very unlikely he's going to stay there. The Steelers are the front runners of teams that have shown the most interest, that have called the Niners the most, and have the best situation and the the best um, compensation to, to relinquish for Ayuk. So I am not going to let that go unnoticed. He had to come out and, and defend his take because aggregator accounts took what Ben said and turned it into, oh, Brandon Ayuk has requested a trade. Mm -hmm. He never did that. He never did that. These people ruined the, the little gift that Ben gave us Steeler fans yesterday talking about, okay, there's interest there with Brandon Ayuk. And these accounts took that and just crapped all over it, putting words in his mouth saying, oh, he requested a trade. Albright never said he requested a trade. All he was doing, with intentions behind it, was pointing out that the Steelers have a lot of interest in Brandon Ayuk, and the situation in San Francisco is not going well with Ayuk and the Niners. Thus, i.e., the Steelers look like the most likely landing spot for him. He could go somewhere else. The Bills need a receiver. There's talk about the Cowboys. I, I don't know why they would do it, but the Steelers just make sense. It's not hard to see that. If you can take your emotions out of it, if you're somebody out there who doesn't want them to do it, it makes sense. And given their, their draft needs and the situation they're in with their picks, it wouldn't be a bad, in fact, it'd be a great idea to, to get Brandon Ayuk in here because he would solve a problem really fast. And don't forget, if you take a receiver in the draft, even if you get him in the first round or second round, there's no guarantee he hits. The Steelers are the right. best in the business that take in a wide receiver, for sure, bar none. But acquiring Brandon Ayuk, you're getting the certainty that he's already really, really good. There's no doubt about it. There's no projection. He's going to come in and be your fringe wide receiver one because he's already better than Pick Pickens is a wide receiver one for us right now, but he's he'd be the one if we got Ayuk. And it would also help you in the future with with leveraging George Pickens' contract debate. Like, there's all these reasons why it would be a positive for the Steelers, and there's very few negatives, but the negatives are what get people's attention and, and or what they're the easy thing to bring up. Like, oh, I don't want to give up too much. Nobody does, dude. But if they can get him for not too much, why not do it? People, people, how quick we forget that people were all on my ass about giving up a first or second round pick for Justin Fields. And I said, I don't think we have to give that for him. We got him for way less. And the longer the Niners wait, and the longer all these stories come out about Ayuk being unhappy in these social media posts, the less leverage they have. If he were to request a trade, that would be the cherry on top of this because the Niners would have no leverage left. He hasn't done that yet because I think Ayuk uniquely is taking this, uh, he's taking this situation with this contract and the trade possibilities in a very mature thought out way where he, he showed up today for the Niners offseason day one of workouts because he knows he still can try to force the Niners to pay him, but they probably can't. So he wants to play ball for the time being to look good to other teams, get a good trade package and, and put himself in the best scenario possible for, for himself and his career. And, and a lot of those roads lead to the Steelers, in my opinion, because Despite all of the meetings and the interest in these draft prospects, it may not fall the way the Steelers want it to with, with, with drafting a wide receiver. Because when you try to draft a tackle and a center in rounds one and two, it's a big risk in, in trying to get your wide receiver two for six, 17 games in the third round. It's, it's very unlikely. Yeah, and do you view George Pickens as that wide receiver one or is he still a wide receiver two? What kind of player do you complement with him? Uh, we were talking, yeah. there's a lot of talk about that. I was just mentioning like, you know, some of these players are maybe more sp slot specific. We didn't talk about like Xavier Worthy. He's not really on the Steelers radar, I don't think. But there's somebody that has been linked even with the Kansas City Chiefs, for example. 
hey, here's somebody you could get at the end of the first round. It's like a Tyreek Hill uh, type of clone, for example. So it's like when you look at, uh, I, I just like kind of comparing to the Bengals. It's like you have Jamar Chase, you have T. Higgins. Well, you're, they already had T. Higgins, and then they went over the top and grabbed Jamar Chase. That's the Brandon Ayuk move. Is a Donnie Mitchell that kind of move? No. Brian Thomas, if he lands there, now he's going to be in the green room. So they expect him to go first round. If they made that kind of splash, I just haven't seen any of the kind of links for that. Thomas uh, Jr. is the one, too. Thomas Jr., he mm-hmm. he fits the bill of, like, every year in the draft. There's corners and wide receivers who are super tall, super fast. They jump out of the gym. They run good 40s, and they always get elevated in the draft. Because Brian Thomas, Martavis Bryant comparisons aside, he's a lot more refined and doesn't have the off-the-field issues. Like, he, if I'm trying to pick a guy who's going to go higher than anticipated, Brian Thomas Jr. would would lead that charge because I could see a world where he goes, as soon as the top three go, uh, Harrison, Neighbors, and Adunze, as soon as they're gone, that's going to create a run and a sense of urgency on receivers. And if a team is banking on a guy's ceiling, I think Thomas Jr. is likely to be that fourth guy off the board. And that could be as early as like pick 11 or pick 12. Um, if he falls to 20, it's going to be considered in the Steelers green room, I'm sure. But again, that get, that brings us back to the conversation of like, are they willing to invest in that position in the first round and, and miss out on a more valuable position like tackle or cornerback? Because tackle, corner, quarterback, and edge rusher are the most important positions. And they need a tackle and they need a corner. Are, are they going to pass on a guy like Wiggins or Mitchell from Toledo or Kool-Aid McKinstry, or um, the other, uh, the, the, other the, the Alabama guy, uh, Terry and, um, yeah, Arnold, Arnold, yeah, yes. Ar- Ar- Arnold, yeah, Arnold, Arnold's hard to predict. He, he's he's been talked about as CB one, also as a pick for the Steelers at twenty. So are they willing to pass on a potential franchise lockdown corner like that who could be there, or receiver who who is more ceiling than not in Brian Thomas Jr. I personally don't know, and like I said, Mitchell has like attitude concerns he's a great player but it doesn't seem like it would be a very stealer move to go that way I, as different and as refreshing as omar khan has been there is still a bit of structure there from kevin colbert because he was his mentor and i just think that gun to my head tackle or corner makes a lot more sense in the first round than receiver which then leads me to the oh well could they get a receiver in the second or third round they want to start which then leads me to, well, second round, they got to take center, which then leads me to, they're probably not going to get a good receiver in the third round, which then leads me to get Brandon Ayuk for your first round pick, take somebody at 31, take a center in the second round, and then you may end up with Dan Moore for one more year, but it, it isn't as bad as it sounds. He, he's not totally inept out there, and the Steelers, more than anyone, have shown confidence in this guy, and given their needs, and the draft selection they have, I just I, I keep coming back to this this scenario where they get Ayuk, they get a second round center, and then they just roll with Dan Moore for next year. Maybe they get a guy like the pit tackle. He may fall to the third or fourth round because of yeah. injury concerns, but he's viewed as a guy who may eventually be a good starter. So mm-hmm. take him in the third round. Man, th- these are situations where you can't have your cake and eat it too. The Steelers have too many needs, unfortunately. They're not a terrible team, but they have too many needs to make everybody happy. Yeah, I wanted to say the pit tackle. Uh, you see, he threw me off. I wanted to look and see what his snap counts were because uh, there are a couple um, very position flexible players besides Dukes Barton as well, which a lot of people have. And it is. It's it's Matt. Uh, I think it's gone gone Calvis is how you say this or gone Calvis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he played primarily as a left tackle last year, but then he played both the previous year, and of course the injuries took some of that away. Three year starter. Uh, you know, the big uh, ACC team, you know what I mean? These are the type of things that like somebody like Mike Tomlin looks at when they're picking players. So then it tosses you out to, we didn't really talk about two guys. I look at later. If you're looking at day three, let's say that they do a double dip. Let's just say they did trade for Ayuk, And I still think they're going to draft somebody because most of the DBs that they're looking at, there's a few that are going to land in the late rounds. They don't they don't have seventh rounds. They just have the sixth. Most of their picks are high up. They have two threes 
uh, this year. So some of these guys might be like a James Pierre type that are going to have to help with special teams. You got, uh, so anyways, Taj Washington, USC. He's a guy that's a willing blocker. That's what they like. And he's a guy that can play help in the return game. That's what they like. Now I know they have Patterson, but you know, forward thinking or somebody can develop, throw a flyer at him, sixth rounder. He he doesn't do punts. Uh, Patterson doesn't do punts. Yes. So they're going to need somebody else. Quez Watkins. That's why he's round two. I don't like, I don't have any comfort level with Van Jefferson. I did come out of the draft. Quez Watkins, not as much either way. So these are just kind of bodies that are there. If they have to, you know, shimmy shake or whatever. And who's to say they could add somebody like far down the line, a cat, a uh, camp casualty. Somebody's getting sniffed around for being traded before the season starts. It's not all the end of the world type stuff, but then they Tyler have to Boyd's sh- still out there. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm, I'm done with him. I think he's going back to the Bengals, depending on what they do in this draft too. They're probably looking the same thing, offensive line and wide receiver. I guarantee it. So he, th- he has all the makings of someone who's just going to go off the, off the reservation and beaten path from what we've all heard, because I think the the rumors of him almost being a Steeler were true, but the disconnect of the Steelers wanting to pay him as a wide receiver three and him wanting wide receiver two money just ruined it, and nobody else had that much interest. The Chiefs did, from what I heard, but they went and got Hollywood Brown. Tyler Boyd's situation is all the makings of him waiting till the draft is done and then signing somewhere randomly for a one-year deal, like the Titans mm-hmm. or something, just to try to get back into free agency the next year. So, yeah. He's off my radar too, pretty much. And I apologize to the listeners, but the thing was, is what I was hearing was different from the the contract negotiations that was going on. The Steelers wanted Tyler Boyd and he wanted to come here and it was almost done, but it was a difference of like three to $4 million. That's like, dude, you're not, they don't view him as that good, especially given the fact that they have intentions of drafting a receiver relatively high, if not trading for Brandon Ayuk, because they don't want to pay a guy like Tyler Boyd to come in as an average wide receiver and make good money if they're going to take this route and draft a guy high anyway or get Ayuk. It just ended up not making sense for them. So, yeah, I, I think double dipping, though, I, I think if you're going to pick one spot this year in the draft to double dip, receiver makes a lot of sense because, as we've mentioned, George Pickens is by himself in the room. He's the Will Smith mean uh, when everybody's moving out of the house in, in Bel Air. Because Quez Watkins, yeah, he's a speed guy, good for him. Van Jefferson, draft type, Florida Gator coming out. He did well with the Rams his first few years. But neither guy moves the needle for you, man. And that's coming from me, somebody who's genuinely very like positive and high on guys once they put on the black and gold. But neither of those two moves moves the needle for me at all. No. I, I think they're still very interested in drafting a guy, possibly getting Ayuk. And, and yeah, I think two two new receivers going into camp and not like just undrafted guys you've never heard of. I mean, two guys who are probably likely going to make the team and make an impact on this roster in 2024 are yet to be on the Steelers roster. And Could we, that be Ayuk and, and Luke McCaffrey? Sure. Could it be Malachi Corley and Taj Washington? Sure. But I, I think, yeah, it's going to be two new guys, however they figure out to make that work. I think we need to, uh, we, we never mention it's because like he didn't get to do a whole lot last year. He missed his whole rookie season. Calvin Austin, fastest yeah. guy in the draft, just two, two years removed. It still take the top off. And it's like, where do you position these guys? You usually, I mean, this is Arthur Smith's offense now. It's a little different. Are you going to have guys that are strictly like an X or are you going to have guys that are strictly slot? Are you going to move them around like they did with Deontay Johnson, like they've done with George Pickens? So um, position flexibility plays in a factor there. I totally, uh, I could see, you can't put all your eggs in the Calvin Austin basket because he is a smaller player. He's already shown he can maybe be injury prone. But he is fast too, so you got to take that into account that he could take the top off, and maybe that still helps. And you add somebody else, but it is a very young room, and adding some leadership like an Ayuk would be nice. I also think Mike Tomlin loves his generational bloodline players. I mentioned this maybe on the last show, and Luke McCaffrey just checks all of those boxes. A possession type receiver, he's not going to go very high in the draft, I would think. Uh, I'd be shocked if he goes before the fourth round, and fourth round might be high for him too. So. Yeah. He just doesn't have, what do you want to say, the same measurables coming out as his father, Ed McCaffrey, or his brother, uh, Christian. So that'll be some interesting stuff. Uh, And, of course, Corley. We've mentioned Corley several times. It's like Corley could be like people are looking like to use him like a hybrid role, like a Debo Samuel or something like that. So there may be more suitors for him, and he could be off the board real quick. 
So it just leads right back to that whole tackle thing. And if you go offensive line, offensive line, and you're sitting there in the third round, sure, maybe, maybe somebody that we aren't necessarily – um, there's names we haven't even mentioned that are going to be maybe in the top 50, top 100, like Troy Fl- Franklin out of Oregon. Uh, yeah. 6'3", we, 187. We just, we, just haven't, we just haven't showed any interest in Franklin. I think he's a good player, but there's been no meetings or anything with him. And that's a part of the the, the part of the IUK trade that also like I'm bullish on is the fact that I already kind of want the Steelers to trade back at 20. Regardless of Brandon Ayuk or not, I think we're going to be at 20, and they're going to get to our pick, and there's going to be like two to three tackles, two to three corners, all the centers – still there. So regardless of Brandon, I trade back to get an extra pick to help with this. What I keep saying right now is we have too many needs to, to mm-hmm. fill all of them. So if you can trade back because you have multiple tackles, multiple corners and all the centers at 20 do it. But if they were to specifically swap picks with the 49ers, 20 and 31 Mims from Georgia, there is talk of him going top 10, but there's also a lot of concern because of how raw he is and how little he's played at a high level at right tackle. They could trade for Ayuk, get pick 31 back, take Mims, take your center in the third, and then bam, that is that is a wet dream scenario. You got Ayuk at 20, Mims at 31, Zach Frazier at 51, then I don't care who the, who the hell we take for the rest of the draft because those three first picks – home run. These are things that the Steelers, if I, if I'm, I'm really dumb. I, I know the Steelers, <laughs> but like, if I can think about this stuff and I can talk myself through this, you better believe they're having this converse, these conversations themselves. They know better than anybody. They have multiple needs and they're trying to figure out a way to maximize the picks they have and, and do like the, do the best possible thing to get this team ready to compete in 2024. I tie it back to the quarterback room. The fact they have Russell Wilson and Justin Fields in here on one-year deals, they're trying to make a run here and do something. They don't want to just beat around the bush and, and plan for next year. So getting a guy like Ayuk makes a lot of sense. Drafting a tackle who can eventually secede Dan Moore as a rookie makes sense. Getting your immediate center starter makes sense. These are the things that I try to do when I when I'm before I just get into arguments on Twitter or or text you and I'm all upset and I'm like, dude, this guy's saying this. There, there's thought behind all of this. It isn't Talk always you off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, it, it isn't always the most organized, but there, there's a method to the madness. Is all I'm saying. And the, the, the needs that the Steelers have at all these positions and the interest in receivers specifically and Ayuk specifically and first round tackles and corners. It's like the Steelers are leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for us to try to figure out what they're doing. Um, without coming out and saying, like, blatantly. Yeah, I agree. And there's still defensive line. We haven't talked anything about defensive linemen. I mean, it's another spot that they got to look maybe toward the future. Larry Ogunjobi's, what, got a year or two left on his contract. Uh, he's starting to push 30 years fades. It's the other problem with Tyler Boyd too, a 30 year old wide receiver that probably wants more money in a multiple year contract. A lot of teams are avoiding that before yeah, the draft. Exactly. They're going to see what they can get in the draft. And then after, so he doesn't affect their compensatory pick formula and screw up their opportunity to get a pick in the future. If he signs for, you know, Buku dollars. So yeah, I know this is a receiver show, yeah. but I know you and I both love Braden Fisk out of Florida state. Mm-hmm. He's a monster and the Steelers like him. They've met with Braden Fisk in every, you want to try to predict one guy to go to the Steelers, Braden Fisk. They've met with him every which way. Senior Bowl, Combine, Top 30 visit. They love Braden Fisk out of Florida State, as do I. He couldn't be blocked at the Senior Bowl. Very good interior pass rush defensive lineman with run stuff ability as well. He's viewed as a third, fourth round pick. So that's a guy that I hope they do take um, however possible. They haven't really shown a lot of interest in guys that are viewed as a higher pick than Braden Fisk. They like the guy from Clemson. I think they met with him at the combine. Um, or Aranwo, Aranru. I, I don't want to mess up his name, but you can look him up. The Clemson defensive lineman. I think the need is there. That's why I mentioned it at the beginning of the show that they could use a good defensive lineman to add to the mix behind our top three. Um, but they haven't shown a lot of interest through visits and meetings that they're going to do it too high. So Fisk just fits the bill of everything we're talking about here where He's going to help fill a need they have, and they're probably going to be able to get him in the third or fourth round. It's just, it's like the Malachi Corley thing though. It's like, we like him. I know a lot of other teams do as well. So when, when is, when is being patient too patient? When, when is drafting 
too high a reach. That That's why guys like Omar Khan, and, and that's why they get paid what they're paid, because they have to decide when is the right time to take a guy like Braden Fisk or Malachi Corley. Yeah, Fisk. I think Fisk will probably be top 75, maybe top 50 in that range. The other guy they were looking at from LSU seems to be mocked all over the place, Mason Smith. And then, of course, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a guy from Northern Iowa that really, uh, Christian Boyd, who they just had in for a top 30 visit, kind of reminds me of a Javon Hargrave type prospect. Oh, okay. Be interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're talking about FCS, it's like, how high are you going to go? They also just had in an offensive lineman, interior offensive lineman. I believe he also played some tackle. I think he plays all five spots. Uh, McCormick out of South Dakota State projected to perhaps play center. Now, do you play those games again like you did with Kendrick Green? They've already been burned once with that. You know what I mean? So that's uh, it's it's always kind of questionable, but they do need depth there as well, unless you're counting on Spencer Anderson or or the other, the one Herbig brother to kind of step in and be a backup center. Uh, but you have to be position flexible in order to go in those spots. And it really, that does, it wrecks havoc. It makes it impossible to just hone in on, I know we're talking about all these other positions, all these other prospects. We're a week out from the NFL draft. And it just, it, it like makes you speculate. The Steelers could take a wide receiver in every single round, but it really, it's like, well, they could go here, but what if they look at a corner? What if they look at a defensive lineman? What if they're wanting a right tackle? Then exactly, it kind of it's exactly what I've been so, exactly what I've been so like stuck with these past few weeks and frustrated with. And what keeps leading me back to all these endless scenarios, it seems for them to, to them to go down because yeah, they, they need all these spots, the, these main important spots, but they pick at 20. And they, they, if you if you don't take a tackle in the first round, can you really get a guy who's worth anything in the second or third round? Unlikely. It, it, you don't have to take a center in the first round, but you have to take him in the second or third. Otherwise, you miss out. Well, if you do that, then receiver becomes like, yeah, it, it, it's it's a mess right now. It, it, like I, I love it and I hate it at the same time because it, this is uh, one of the more unpredictable um pre-draft seasons that I feel like I've been a part of in recent memory where the past few years dating back to like dating back to like TJ Watt, maybe even the year before. Yeah. Already burns. It was easier to pick out what they were doing or at least where they were thinking position wise. Now, now it's like, it, it almost feels like a crap shoot. Like, yeah, we can zero in on like three or four spots in particular. Like we have been all show, but it, it does. It just doesn't, it feels so uncertain right now, which, which only fuels my fire more for, for the Brandon Ayuk stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and if you really want to throw another wrench into this whole thing, Cooper Tijan comes out corner from Iowa says yeah, his yeah, medicals yeah. are all clear. And then the Steelers immediately bring him in for a visit for one of their top thirties too. And, and there's the, the, the whole speculation on that. Where does he play? Does he play corner? Does he play safety? A lot of people have him pegged as a safety at the, yeah. you know, NFL level. So the net throws he's out. White. Yeah, it is. I mean, because he's it's... white. You're the you're the white boy at the skill positions. Because we got, I, I just noticed as I was rattling off the names, we had Pearsall, Ricky Pearsall, yes. uh, Luke McCaffrey, and Lad McConkey yes. all in here. Yeah, all white dudes. <laughs> and, and then uh, D Cooper DeJean or Dijon, year of the white boy, playing playing one of the athletic spots. And, and uh, yeah, and always unfortunately. Sit safety and slot they're always like safety and slot don't put those guys on the boundary <laughs> yeah you can't handle it i mean every once in a while you get a unicorn that comes through you get a white knight no pun intended and a lot of these guys aren't your typical luke mccaffrey's pr pretty standard white dude playing wide receiver but pearsall and mcconkey they, they have more wiggle to their game than that if you catch what i'm saying mm -hmm. and i think cooper dejean has proven yeah he, he's probably best suited as a utility defensive back but he can play nickel safety. If he has to play outside, it's not going to be like a, a detriment to, to he's talented. That's the reason why he also returned punts for Iowa. Like he's a very athletic skilled player. So the, the first round hype surrounding Cooper DeGene is warranted. And uh, I, I wouldn't be that upset with that pick. In fact, Cooper DeGene is one of the names that if the Steelers were to trade back, he's one of my most likely like candidates for them to take because he seems to be hanging around the mid-20s, 30, 31 range whenever you go through people's mocks so you try to do it yourself. So he's a name they could get if they trade back. Kool-Aid McKinstry, they could probably get if they trade back. I, I, I partially believe Mims might fall. Guys with ceilings rise, but they also fall because people are concerned about their development. So it is a roll of the dice. Um, I'll say this too. I don't. 
I don't not want it, but I'll, I'll be less enthused about trading for Ayuk if they're not able to retain a first round pick this year. That that is a large reason why I'm so gung ho on getting Ayuk because I think swapping first with the Niners it is a very real like possibility that the Steelers can can bargain with and be like, hey, you move up eleven spots, we'll take yours. We still get something. Like it all, especially because the Niners, similar to the Steelers, they could use. Um, a corner or a tackle uh, or a receiver to replace Ayuk. Maybe they get 20, take Brian Thomas Jr. We get Ayuk. Sounds good to me. Yeah, and I want to jump back to the trade compensation in a second, but just two more names thrown out there. Aren't names that have been on the Steelers' radar, but could be in this same mix where, hey, another team takes them and then, you know, somebody like a Corley slides a little bit. Uh, Roman Wilson, Michigan, uh, six foot, one, uh, 192 pounds, plays primarily at the slot, but is a little more versatile. We oh, mentioned yeah, dude. I, w- watch, us ta- watch us take him now. I totally forgot about Wilson. I, I'm ashamed. <laughs> I have him written down here. I forgot to mention Roman Wilson and Bub Means from Pitt. Bub Means met with us at the Combine. He's a late-round pick. But, uh, yeah, Roman Wilson met with us at the Senior Bowl and the Combine. So there's interest there. He hasn't been a top-30 visit, but – they, they like him enough to potentially be that round two or three receiver for sure. Yeah, and, and he's good. I, I like Roman Wilson. I just, I totally spaced on mentioning him. Keon Coleman, large target Florida State. Um, still young. I was looking up his age here. I don't think he's had his 21st birthday yet. He has not. May 17th, he will turn 21. These are the kind of guys like Juju Smith-Schuster. I don't believe George Pickens was a visit either. So would they have a history of wide receivers? Um I think James pro Washington day, pro, uh, day, pro days. Yeah, they get a lot of pro days like James Washington, somebody like that. Who they uh, picked. Yeah, they 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 yeah. they, they went so they they picked George Pickens, they read his pro Correct. day. That, that, but they go to like a whole but there's not very many pro days do. that they do miss. So it's like when yeah. they have a visit, it's almost like this is either they're trying to throw someone sent off of someone else, but wide receiver, I feel like more than anything else, they kind of have their homework done and then they would be, they would be more prone to taking, we, we don't have to be so tied to, Hey, that guy visited with them. I think that holds a lot more stock when we're talking about right tackles, for example, than it would wide receiver when you're going into those type of positions, same with the DB, same with the corners, I think too, like they're going to meet with some of them, but they're kind of all over the board with those guys. Yeah, I- I just think it helps. I think it helps mm-hmm. like zero yeah, in. They, they, they take a lot of their top 30 guys. And Roman Wilson is the best example as we just like perfect timing to talk about Roman Wilson. I think he's a very likely candidate and wasn't a top 30 visit because they were able to meet with him at the combine, the senior bowl, George Pickens, just a pro day kind of thing. They were at Juju's pro day as well. They didn't, they didn't have him for a visit, but they, they got to know him through that way. And uh, Juju and Pickens, coincidentally enough, I think they both are cut from a similar cloth where they both fell farther than people were expecting. And the Steelers were just kind of like, all right, we'll, we'll take George Pickens and Juju Smith-Schuster because yeah. I know personally, I, I forgot Juju was available I know. during that draft. We picked him and I was like, oh, sweet. Like I, I remember seeing him I know. the first round in most mocks. So when we picked him, I, w- I was psyched. And uh, same with Pickens. I, I didn't forget he was there, but it made sense wh- why they pulled the trigger when they did. And it's it's not unheard of that they draft a guy that they met with like not at all. It, it just it helps connect the dots. I think I think doing a smoke screen for a top thirty visit is bad business, and I don't think the Steelers really do that often. Maybe Penix Jr. because they brought Michael Penix Jr. in for a top thirty visit, but I tend to believe that's more of like okay if teams pass on him for three or four rounds because of his medicals and his age, we'll take him maybe in the fourth, but. Or maybe in the future, like do it, like trying to put some uh, work in now to maybe acquire him later in his career. But a top thirty visit is so valuable, and like teams only get thirty. So I, I I put a lot of stock into who they bring in for those thirty visits. But if they go to a guy's pro day or they met with him at the combine or the senior bowl, I still put stock into that too. It's just the top thirty guys seem like guys they're really zeroing in on and trying to learn more about hence bringing them into the building themselves. Yeah. Devin Bush, Artie Burns are those type of guys that weren't visits. And it seems almost like they, they, uh, they've, they had a dinner with Chase Winovich that year and instead, instead of Bush. So they'd met with his teammate 
And they still needed an edge rusher. And everybody thought Winovich was going to be like in that first round, like very high pick, maybe high second. He ended up going in the third round. You just never know. And it, and of course, you know, going back to my Youngstown State guy, Derek Rivers, Derek years Rivers. ago, same draft as TJ Watt. That was just the pick, right? They, they visited that guy at every event they had. They had him in for a visit. It was just like, if you looked at that chart and it was like every kind, kind of contact they were permitted to have, they did. He and checked every box. Draft him. Yeah, check well, every they, single they box. They can meet with the guy, though, not like what he has to offer. That Correct. could have been the case with Rivers. So they could be doing it to a lot of double, times. <laughs> double check, triple check. Exactly. So, And that that's so funny, man. That's my favorite and least favorite part every year of this time of year because it's so funny how every single year to me, people just they, they do this, this thing where they like, well, there's no way so-and-so is going to be available in the second round. There's no way this guy's going to fall that far. It happens every year, man. There's only 32 picks. And I, some of my favorite examples, DK Metcalf, Chase Claypool, like guys fall every year that aren't supposed to fall, whether it be just to the later of the first round or, or second, third, fourth round. It, it happens every year, and people just forget that. And they're like, oh, you." It, it, it was happening early in this year, and people have retroactively, it seems, brought back their takes. But when – um like the Super Bowl ended and all this draft coverage started, the talk was, oh, there's no way Jackson Powers Johnson is even going to make it to the Steelers at 20, like the center from Oregon. And now most people have become hip to the fact, eh, no, he's probably going to be there in the second round, actually. May may maybe picked at the end of the first. Like there's this possibility that if a team needs a center, they may jump for the very best one at the very end of the first. But it's always been right in front of, these people's faces like dude centers don't go high and every year there are guys that are oh the Steelers better take him now otherwise they're not going to get him later and they end up getting him later look no further than last year's draft when they were able to get Joey Porter in the second round who was supposed to be a first round lock Keanu yeah. Benton in the later second round who was supposed to be a high second round late first round pick Darnell Washington who I saw mocked in the first round like yeah. It happens every year. Guys fall because teams have different needs. Teams like different guys. And there's only 32 picks per round. So let's look at some past draft day trades for the wide receivers before we jump off here. We're pretty, we're, we're up against it, but just because of the compensation, you were saying the, um, you know, would you give up? I, I, you're, you're talking about a swap in the first round and then maybe another pick for Ayuk, who has one year remaining on his contract, will who will get extended for bigger money. He needs paid. Yeah, he needs paid, too, which will, which should yeah. help help the team who's trading for him's leverage because he needs paid. So you're already you're already admitting that you're going to... Yeah. Yeah, potentially. yeah, potentially. But it, it should help because the Niners, it hurts their leverage, helps the trading team's leverage. I know, yeah, A.J. Brown, uh, Hollywood Brown, who are we starting yeah, with here? Yeah, A.J. Brown was a first round and a third round pick, like pick 101. So that were, there was no swap involved with that than the player in an extension. But you look at Tyree Kill, five draft picks to the Chiefs. Now, I believe he was under an extension and may have had two years left on his deal. Tyree uh, Kill's the best receiver in the NFL. So I, I, that, Tyree Kill is the, the best yeah, receiver in the Yeah, but look at this. NFL. Uh, first round pick and a second round pick and a fourth round pick all within that same year, 2022, and then two fu future picks in the fourth and the sixth round. Five draft picks to obtain Tyree Kill is wild. Like, to me, that's not a trade I would want to make as the Steelers. And then, depending on what IU wants, because Tyree Kill's making what? He's clearing almost $30 million a year. Yeah. I'm talking about that, too. That's a big chunk of money. So, it makes it, it tough. It makes it, yeah, it really makes it tough because he is like, I, I wouldn't want them to good. do that. That's the, that's the caveat to this that I, I'm glad you're bringing this up because that's a big part of this where, as alluded to earlier, people love to just shut the conversation down and make you feel small and dumb. Like, oh, you want to do, no, if you're telling me right now the Niners want our first round pick this year, our first round pick next year, our second this year and our second next year, no, I don't want to do that, dude. Like, clearly I don't want to do that. I, I have belief, like, we all were sucking Omar Khan's farts out of his ass for the whole first year he's been in charge here because he's so great at what he does. Where is that belief? Where where is that like that 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 um confidence in him that he's as good as what he does when we're talking about this? People just throw all that out. They're like, "Oh, I don't want to give up all this." Omar Khan wouldn't do that. He wouldn't screw the Steelers. I, I think he knows what he's doing. I think if they are to get Ayuk, it'll be for fair compensation. If they were to give away their first this year and not get a first back and trade next year's. I, do, I don't want to do that. 
I, I only want to do it if I think it can be achieved for a reasonable, pr reasonable price, just like Justin Fields. I, I am very happy they were able to pull that off for such minimal compensation. Now, Ayuk won't be had for a conditional fourth round pick. No, not at but, all. But swapping first and giving up next year's second, starting there, that, that's plausible. I think it's really – because A.J. Brown also, that was a surprise. A.J. Brown wasn't, like, causing a stink. He wasn't, like – there weren't talks about Tennessee not being able to pay him. They weren't paying other guys too much. Yeah. This IU situation is is very, very unique in itself where th I think the Niners also see the the horizon and they can see that they have to pay Brock Purdy pretty soon here. So with all the money they're already spending elsewhere, that that's what – there are all these factors that make the Brandon IU situation just different from situations we've seen in the past. Tyreek Hill was a surprise as well. I'll say that for sure. That No one saw that coming. But Tyreek Kill is, is the best receiver in the NFL, so I, he, he's different. He, he's on a different level, and I think the Dolphins are happy with that move based off of how they've performed with him thus far. They haven't won the championships, but they, they've been a way better team with him than without. So I think that was a good move for them, all things considered, how they've been so far. Um, and, and I think if the Steelers were to acquire Ayuk, I, I think it would work. It's just a matter of finding the right price. Yeah, Titans are just so dumb. And then they went and traded. They went and got like Julio Jones and acquired that dumbass contract. And then they went and did the same with Hopkins. They just kept AJ Brown the whole time. Like I don't. Like, they, they they thought they were going to be able to replace AJ Brown with Ty, Tyron or Tri, uh, Burks. Yes, that's who it was. Uh, they, they that's who they used the pick on uh, the first. Yeah, round they pick. picked him in the first. He was supposed to be his replacement. Mm -hmm. He's just he's just nowhere near. The, AJ Brown's a top five wide receiver in this NF in the league right now. And Burks, he, that was a total roll of the dice and. Kind of like what I'm saying, how I'd rather relinquish 20 for Brandon Ayuk than roll the dice on Brian Thomas Jr. Yeah. You know? And, and it's a crapshoot. Like you said, are you going to have a rookie come out there and play right away? You get known production. And if you kick, if you could pay that kind of forward into the future, let Omar Khan cook and see what else he might be able to get. The the, the catch 22 to this is he got a second rounder for Chase Claypool and ended up being picked 32. And that was for Chase Claypool, who was... Where's he at now? CFL? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or looking yeah, at Con, it. Yeah, we might have screwed ourselves with that. We might have been able Omar Khan would be too good at what he does. So now everybody's hip to like his, like his uh, strategies. Yeah. But I think the AJ Brown and the Tyreek Hill thing had a lot to do with uh, all of a sudden these guys looked at that uh, Christian Kirk deal down to Jacksonville and said, Whoa, yeah. what the? No, I need paid. You know, back the, back the and, truck up, you know? Yeah. And, and Ayuk's going to be expensive. Mm -hmm. that, don't, don't. Uh, get it twisted. He's going to cost a lot of money, but when you're a team like the Steelers who don't have any money invested in quarterback, these are the type of moves you can make. And the fact they need a receiver so bad, it's 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 easy to connect the dots. And it, it's going to be uncomfortable for some people, but you, you pay good players. You you can't just you can't keep fielding a team and not paying anybody. We we've gotten used to them paying defensive guys with the occasional offensive guy, but every team does it. it, it it's gonna it's gonna sting seeing like oh the Steelers have extended Brandon Ayuk for a for a five year hundred million dollar contract like oh wow it's a lot of money it's like that's that's the market that that's what good receivers get paid you can't just I don't know about five hundred on... million but <laughs> no a hundred a hundred oh I thought you no, said five hundred five years hundred million uh, they could probably do that right now and I'm looking ahead Twenty a year. Well, yeah. ne next year they only have 27 players under contract. They have uh, 96 million projected in cap space, according to OverTheCap.com. It's very clearly depending on. Obviously, they have no quarterback contract in that equation. George Pickens is still under the rookie deal for two more seasons. So by the time they have to do any type of contract or extension, if they were to retain him as well, you're already two years into the IUK deal and could front maybe front load some of that money next year and then offset some of the the other ones into the future and now you still what like 26 so you probably 26. whatever contract extension he gets is going to get him to about age 30 uh through his prime years i i said it on the last show don't be surprised if it happened it's weird because they hadn't heard any chatter any radio static any noise about this brian and i all of a sudden we're talking about it in the next day you know like you said uh a little little birdie came out and it was like boom, like wildfire it was like well way to be ahead of that that was just some spec just speculation on my part so yeah yeah it, it almost it almost ruined it because that, that that little tidbit of information mm -hmm. we got fr from albright was like this is great this is exciting and then a bunch of aggregators and people that just want clicks they they turned it into something it wasn't yet but the the, the 
important part to remember is the Steelers are sniffing around and they're interested. They're calling. They're they're probably leading the teams interested in the guy. And it could not happen but with how these things go. It definitely could not happen. I, I I've gotten spoiled this year with Justin Fields, and I also not to brag, but I I did speculate that we were going to sign Patrick Queen the morning of when we got him. But more often than not, these situations don't happen. And if it weren't to happen. There are guys they've shown interest in and brought in for visits and looked at that I am still bullish on a portion of this class. I, I, I like Ricky Pearsall. I like Malachi Corley. Leggett's a good player. I think Lad McConkey is better than he gets credit for because he's a short little white dude, but I, I think he's better than he gets credit for. And um, Taj Washington and McCaffrey in the later rounds, those are, pick, those are classic Steeler picks where – they may not move the needle of the national media circuit, but they'll be, they can be good players for the Steelers. So, Ayuk or not, I, I like this class as far as the first three and a half rounds are considered. Once you get past there, it's like McCaffrey and Washington and a bunch of nobodies. And it looks like the Steelers know that because they brought in a large portion of second, third round guys and then a couple of late round guys because once you get past the third round, it's not a very deep class. It's very top heavy and it's very talented. And um, I hope they're able to get somebody in that top half, if not Ayuk. But if they don't get Ayuk, they don't get a top half guy. They're going to be sitting here with their hands in the air, like, okay, Luke McCaffrey, your wide receiver too. That that's not a good strategy. So <laughs> I, I like I like McCaffrey yeah. as a possible like addition to this offense and team and a, a future helper contributor. But you can't you can't draft a guy in the fifth, sixth round and be like, okay, it's going to be you and Van Jefferson competing for wide receiver too. And even, so, yeah, even when they do that, like Emmanuel Sanders, Sammy Coates, you know, you, you hit or miss. Antonio Brown was a sixth rounder, but they had, uh, uh, what is it? Jonathan Brown or what did it, they had another kid named Brown that wasn't in yeah, John, jo- Justin Brown, Justin think, Brown. Jo- that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Justin Brown. So it was like uh, he had like a game that was decent yeah. and then gone afterthought. You know what I mean? And then some of the guys they've traded for like a Ryan Switzer and they just fall off a cliff or something like that. So we are up against it in case we don't get to talk again. Uh, right in your wheelhouse too with the DBs middle, maybe second, uh, third round targets. I'd love if they could get either of these guys in the third round. Max Melton, Rutgers, corner, Andrew He's Phillips, great. Kentucky. Love him. Yeah. Love- but, but I both, like Melton, both, Melton better, yeah. but both, yes, both very, very, very Steeler esque, right? Cam, right, Cam right, yeah. Sutton type that could be moved like a chess piece. So yeah, yeah, and they both have been visit, or I know, I know the, I know Phillips was a visit, both, um, was yeah, Mel- both, Melton okay, was cool, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, they scream Steeler defensive back, and in a good way, not in a bad, like they, they are good players that can play slot outside, versatile. Um, they're, they're both every year there are guys like this who rise. They're, they're both so good as mid round corners. They're both being like talked about like, Oh, they might sneak into like the, the late first. They won't, but that's how good these guys are. So yeah, I like Max Melton and I like uh, Phillips or is it Phillips? Yeah. 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 Andrew Phillips. Yeah, Phillips from uh, Kentucky. So uh, either one of those guys, great additions. Um, they need to add to that cornerback room in, in some way. Cause I, I know Jackson can be a stopgap. I'm not like the most, against him just starting for the year, but they got to add somebody else too. And and they're, they're showing us that through their, their actions with these pre-draft visits. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Hey buddy, oh, one week away and then it's Christmas, right? So oh yeah, I guess we'll look at the calendar and see what we could do as far as our live show settings. And then maybe there might be another one or two actually before that. Cause we get a little more deeper into the draft coverage. Yeah. So. I just think the closer we get to Thursday of next week, we'll, we'll have a better like hold on, on what's happening. Like the closer we get, we'll have a better understanding of might have Brandon Ayuk by then. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I think he's a draft day type thing. I don't think it, they said the um, what two two teams were interested in maybe a mystery team. Dun dun dun. Always a mystery. Team. Always that, a that, mystery team. That's just that's crap. I'm sorry, it's crap. Y'all can do that. Oh, I think there might mystery. be maybe a third potentially. That's that's a cop out. They're they're trying to cover their own ass. Like just in case it isn't the Steelers or the Bills. Oh, it ended up being the 
Jaguars. It's like, oh, Eagles. see, mystery team. Yeah, Told yeah you. mystery. It's source. Trust me, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, folks, that'll do it for us. My name's Joe. His name is Zach. Thanks for hanging out with us here. A little bit of extended draft coverage right around the corner. As we discussed, maybe some live coverage coming after eight, uh, one or both of the draft first two days of the draft. Uh, Steelers don't have a whole lot going on on day three. So, and then those aren't as exciting so when we can do a roundup after that which we will so we'll catch you back then don't forget to like comment and most importantly subscribe to get those notifications thank you for watching or listening wherever you may be thank you once again flash for joining us and until next time we encourage everyone out there to be safe be good and we'll catch you later we would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website www.steelcityunderground.com